This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. My honorable and soon to be famous guest today is Josh Stanbro, the Chief Resilience Officer for City and County of Honolulu. Welcome to the club, Josh. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Howard. <clears throat> and the your title says Resilience Officer. And I can't imagine why that would be the case. Let's see, we've got Puerto Rico, we've got South Florida, we've got Houston, and then something, two areas that just recently didn't make the news would, was Central America. They had a huge, huge tropical depression there. Mudslides, people killed. And I just saw that Vietnam, Vietnam had a great big typhoon. I believe it was 56 people killed. Just, just in the last few days, so. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and one that you left off the list is Northern California and the fires, fires there. yes, yes, um, yes. Actually, uh, I, I grew up in Northern California mm -hmm. and grew up on an apple orchard there. We had 80 acres and we actually lost our place and our house uh, along with 300 other homes in our neighborhood to a forest fire um, back in the 90s. And at the time, you know, you sort of think, well, you know, bad luck and, you know, mm -hmm. it got started on accident and it was kind of bad winds and everything. And now when you look back over that arc of, you know, warming summers and bigger mm -hmm. fires and bigger mm -hmm. fires, you know, we were really, I think, probably one of the early victims of, of climate change yeah. and, and this yeah. sort of escalating heat, escalating wind speeds. And, um, and long, prolonged drought conditions. Prolonged drought conditions yeah. that, that yeah. you know, create that tinder. Um, and so we're really seeing, you know, more extreme weather events, but we're also mm -hmm. seeing them happen faster and, and faster. Mm -hmm. um, so resilience is really the name of the game. How do we really um, structure our infrastructure and our societal mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. in the most um, sort of robust way? Because we know it's not a matter of if, it's a mm -hmm. matter of when we're going to encounter some of these, um, just like Maria in, in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. You know, what's our ability to bounce back um, and in the parlance of, of the resilient cities, actually bounce forward. So when you have something like that happen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can you take and incorporate and learn um, from that and build back in a smarter way than you were built before so that you're actually more resilient after the, the impact than, mm -hmm. than before? I saw where Tokyo has now built the world's most sophisticated and huge drainage system in anticipation of I guess most of downtown Tokyo just getting, I don't know, two, three feet of water. What do you do with it? Well, you drain it with this huge system. Yes, and, and I mean, that's yeah. things that we're going to have to be looking at here yeah. where our storm drains were built, obviously, for a certain level of sea level, mm -hmm. right? And so what we think of as what we call outfalls now, stormwater outfalls, mm -hmm. at some point when those sea levels rise, they actually become infalls. Um, and so what we need to be careful as we move forward and as we plan new communities, as we rebuild infrastructure, are we looking out over the horizon long enough to make sure that that infrastructure for its, the term of its, you know, useful life is actually mm -hmm. serving the purpose that, you know, taking stormwater and getting it into the ocean instead of um, mm -hmm. flooding in areas. And, and these are hard, big problems. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's no real easy solutions for these. Well, look, look, especially at Houston, it was, was it three, four, five days later, you still saw people in rowboats going down streets. Well, they, the, the water just couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, they, in the Netherlands, they actually, I mean, where they have been, you know, working under sea level mm -hmm. for a very long time, they have a saying and says, you know, you can't win in a war against water. Water mm -hmm. is you know, it goes wherever it wants to go and it stays where it wants to stay. And, and so, you know, as we move forward, we're, we're really having to think about um, how do you design things so that you're designing for that longer term goal in mind. And in the case of Houston, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, the way that they developed in areas that should have been, that they knew were flood prone, mm -hmm. and in other areas that, you know, used to absorb the rain, um, then all, that all becomes water that doesn't have a place to go. And it's just going to wind up somewhere and sitting at that lowest point. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do we design infrastructure uh, to make sure that we, we avoid that? That's really what the 100 Resilient Cities Network is all about. 
And less people, I'm sure that our, I know our audience is very, very sophisticated, but if there are any doubting Thomases out there, I would remind everybody what happened, what was it, three years ago? We had the confluence of rising sea level, extremely warm air, and one cyclone or typhoon oh, yeah. coming at us af one after another. One actually hit Ka'u on the big island, and fortunately the mountain absorbed it. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know until the last days, and some would go north, some would go south. Somebody upstairs was looking after us, that's for darn sure. Yeah. But let, I, I think that somebody was also saying, knock, 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 consciousness, this is going to happen to you. Yeah, that was yeah. 2015. In 2015, mm -hmm. it was an El Nino year. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you put together, we have a slide that we use in some of our presentations that shows all the different hurricanes mm -hmm. in that year. Mm -hmm. And there's this tiny little blue clear space um, mm -hmm. where the Hawaiian Islands sit. Yeah. That, you know, the one place that, it did, that didn't get hit. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really interesting. Working with the other 100 resilient cities, we, in our cohort is Miami and New Orleans and, and other Gulf Co Coast states, mm -hmm. um, cities. And what they say is, you know, in some ways it's tough in Hawaii because a near miss in Hawaii by a hurricane is a complete miss, right? I mean, it just mm -hmm. goes over the ocean, nobody feels it, nobody's the worst of the wear. Mm -hmm. A near miss to New Orleans it's hitting Alabama, it's hitting their cousins in, you know, Houston. Mm -hmm. And so they know every year they're being reminded about how intense these are, how strong these are, mm -hmm. what, how devastating they can be. And they can see the example of hitting. It may not hit them, but it's hitting somebody they can see yep. and, and yep. know and touch and feel. When we get a near miss, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no hit. So well, we, we get some heavy rain, and that's about it. Right. Yeah. And, and so, mm -hmm. so sort of our, you know, ability to remain vigilant in the face of those mm -hmm. sort of tapers over time, because I think we lose some muscle memory about really how devastating Aniki yeah, was yeah, and how, yeah. how bad it could be. Yeah, hu humans respond to crises, they and that's do. about it. I speak from in my own field. But you mentioned 100 cities. What's all this about 100 cities here? It's really interesting. So mm -hmm. the Rockefeller Foundation, when they turned 100 mm -hmm. years old uh, five years ago, um, for their 100th anniversary, they launched this entirely new program called 100 Resilient Cities. And so what they, the, the president at the time, um, uh, Ms. Roden, she wrote a book called The Resilience Dividend. And what she posited was as cities increasingly have to face these challenges of the 21st century, especially climate change and the mm -hmm. increasing impacts of climate change, but also, you know, modernization, technological modernization, globalization, economic globalization. If there's ways for the cities to actually do sort of double and triple purpose with their projects, not mm -hmm. just addressing mm -hmm. one thing, but actually addressing several societal benefits with mm -hmm. one project, you can realize some savings, fiscal savings, mm -hmm. and also build your resiliency at the same time. Um, and so that's the whole genesis of this 100 Resilient Cities Network. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation set aside funds, and they selected 100 cities from around the globe out of 1,200 cities that applied. And so mm -hmm. we're really proud that Honolulu um, yeah. made the grade and mm -hmm. was one of those 100 cities. Um, and they're, you know, investing in, in our office at the city mm -hmm. and county of Honolulu mm -hmm. and the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency. Um, they're providing technical assistance. Um, and they're really linking us up with the best and brightest ideas from around the globe, mm -hmm. from cities that are on that front edge um, dealing with some of these issues. So, for, an, for instance, Miami, um, you know, really they're dealing with more sea level rise than we are right now because mm -hmm. of the ways that there's, there's actually different levels of sea level rise in yep, different parts yep. of the ocean, which is really interesting and unique. Um, but they're raising their roadbeds by a foot and a half Ooh. to two feet already, and Ooh. it's costing big bucks. And so some of the learning that they're doing on the front end through the network can help us as we decide how do we respond, how do we react, and what's the most efficient, least expensive, and most durable ways mm -hmm. to do that. You, you know, when, when you mentioned raising the roadbeds, what happened back then and what happens almost every year now is on the uh, windward shore where the road goes, the highway goes right along the ocean. Yeah. Doom, doom, doom. Have to close the, the Mackay Lane and build it back up again. And then another storm, boom, 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 collapse, close the lane again, build it back up again. So. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. this is the kind of thing, we would look around on an mm -hmm. island and we see this stuff happening, right? It's no yeah. mystery to mm -hmm. us that things are different, things are changing. 
Um, I think that's part of the reason why the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency was established by voters last November mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, a nearly 20-point margin. Um, and so people, you know, in Hawaii, I think, live close to the land. They have a sense of, you know, they have memories of what they went to, do, to go do, whether it's on the ocean or whether it's roads they traversed and the changes and the differences that they're seeing in terms of beach erosion, l less trade wind days. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we get less trade wind days since the, the early 70s. They've been going down, um, which is a function of climate change. So people know that something's different, and I think they voted, mm -hmm. um, no, you know, knowing, hey, we've, this is a really important issue. We've got to address it. Um, and, you know, thanks to Mayor Caldwell and, uh, you know, the leadership of the Charter Commission to put it in front of voters, and then thanks to the mayor and the city council for really doubling down and, and putting some funds into the office so that we could get a qu quick start um, this mm -hmm. year immediately mm -hmm. following the, uh, the vote from the public. Yeah. N another area that comes to mind is Mapunapuna. It's notorious for flooding, but is, if I remember correctly, the last time it flooded, it was more of a mega flood rather than a mini flood. Yeah, so Mapunapuna yeah. is a really interesting mm -hmm. area, and that, that place where it floods, um, you know, historically it was fish ponds. Okay. Um, and what happened is it had been filled, um, you know, during the time where people were rec reclaiming land and pushing out areas mm -hmm. all along mm -hmm. the, the Honolulu waterfront. And you're getting settling now from those areas that were filled and, you know, probably not compacted, um, you know, as much as they could have been at the time. Mm -hmm. So you've got rising seas, settling land in an area that used to be, um, you know, water. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's tough to make the physics work in some of these areas. And it's going to take some, some real, you know, yeah. engineering feats or um, sort of a repositioning of where, where, it, where do we build? Where are the right places to build? Mm -hmm. Where are the right places to, um, you know, allow? There's going to be a lot of uh, wetlands reemerging as, we, mm -hmm. as the water table itself rises, as sea level rises. And the estimates on that, um, you know, sort of vary um, by the scientific study that comes out. We've got a great team up at the University of Hawaii, mm -hmm. Dr. Chip Fletcher and yep. others who yep. um, follow this religiously and they keep putting out new statistics yep. um, that can help provide guidance to us um, to do better and smarter yeah, development. Yeah, Dr. There. Fletcher is he's the early, early, early adopter. He's been giving those images of Waikiki for many, many years yeah. now. Speaking of which, when the first Chinese came here as immigrants, that was 1860s, I believe, they set up rice paddies in what's now Waikiki. That tells you something about the right. uh, elevation above sea level and the degree of wetness around there. Rice yeah. loves wet. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, you know, that, that was wetlands uh, there. I mean, you think about even in Florida, you know, mm -hmm. almost all of the areas that yep. have been developed there yep. were dredged mm -hmm. and filled and, and mm -hmm. wetlands. And so, you know, there was this assumption at a time previous, and it wasn't a wrong assumption. I mean, at the time, you figured, you know, if, you know, nothing's going to change, so we mm -hmm. can develop these patterns and everything's going to be stable. Mm -hmm. um, and now what we're seeing is, you know, with the advent of sort of the, what, uh, the, the, the Holocene now where we're, you know, this is the Anthropocene, I should say, mm -hmm. where, yep, the, yep, you know, yep. it's humans are changing the very climate that we're in. It mm -hmm. has ramifications. And so all that heat that's being trapped within that blanket that's being knitted every day as we start our cars and we mm -hmm. turn on our lights, um, you know, there's a thread added to that blanket every day and it keeps yep. a little heat in. And what that heat is, is energy. And so that energy has to express itself, and it's expressing itself in these storms that are mm -hmm. more violent, more rain, um, and, and, and just more intense. Yep. And on that very, very cheery note, we need to take a, a little break here. Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii, Mr. Josh Stanbro, Stanbro back in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. My friend, Mother, what big eyes you have! She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah this is the starting line. Push! Uh, This is over. You're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. 
Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with uh, local experts as well as people from across the country. Please Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. Welcome back, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Mr. Josh Stanbro, Chief Resilience Officer for the City and County of Honolulu. And we're not talking about a very cheerful subject, but we all go to the doctor's office once or twice a year for our checkup. We take our cars in to get all checked up. And I think what you're saying, Josh, is that the city and county of Honolulu had gosh darn well also get a checkup in terms of rising sea levels and what's coming down the pike here. Yeah, well, the whole world needs a checkup. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're actually, in some ways, we're um, ahead of the game in terms of establishing an office that's focused on climate change mm -hmm. and really trying to um, do the best that we can to, to pivot and change. And honestly, I mean, while the, the news around the climate is, uh, it's not happy news, the solutions around it are really happy. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're able to pivot and you know, reduce our emissions and increase our quality of life and increase our local food supplies. These are all things that cut our climate emissions and make for a better planet, but they also make for better, healthier kids and, mm -hmm. and people. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, we can look at this two ways. We can either look at it as, wow, we have to really make some sacrifices because mm -hmm. we're in this pickle, mm -hmm. or we can look at it as there's multiple benefits to us doing the right thing around climate. Um, and it really brings us back to, you know, honestly, a society that, you know, he existed here um, not that long ago yeah. where you had a lot of local food, you had people who were pretty resilient, mm -hmm. um, you had a lot of, you know, reliance on, on, on local sources of power. Mm -hmm. It blows my mind that Hokulea yeah. <laughs> just mm -hmm. sailed around the world completely on the Malama Honua voyage mm -hmm. on renewable energy, mm -hmm. and we're still going down to the corner store and not using renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, you know, these lessons have been sitting around for a long, long time, and it's just a matter of us, you know, picking ourselves up and going ahead and tackling it. Yeah, just a little historic side note. Uh, before, Cap or when Captain Cook in the early white... Uh, uh, merchant marine came in, they reported uh, different villages here, there, and everywhere as they were sailing around the islands. And historians estimate that there may have been as many as a half million Hawaiians living on these islands before Captain Cook. And another report is that they were really big and really strong and really robust. The average sailor on Captain Cook's ship was maybe five, six, and his teeth were falling out. He was kind of sickly white, and here you got these big, robust Hawaiians. They, the point being that they were eating really, really well, and they couldn't uh, go down to the supermarket and buy food. <laughs> they had to get it off the land or out of the sea. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but mm -hmm. I know that when you look at the LIDAR images, sort of the radar images of the... Kohala Mountains all the way down. What we see now is grassy slopes with cattle mm -hmm. grazing on them. Underneath all of those mountains for miles and miles and miles stretch old rock terraces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there was thousands and thousands of people putting in tons of work to feed an entire society. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that kind of ingenuity that we need to sort of, and hard work, honestly. So the resilience is really... In, in, the, a better word for resilience maybe is just grit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that ability mm -hmm. to just sort of find a way, adapt, be flexible, and really just grit it out when you have to mm -hmm. and work hard to get past these barriers that, we, that we, yeah, we're encountering. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sort of that pick yourself up, dust yourself off kind of mentality that the strongest cities have. And, and, mm -hmm. and honestly, it's the strongest societies that have been around that are able to find a, where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. um, that's been the case here in Hawaii before, and, and I think that, that's the case now. I think yeah. we can tackle this. And I'm reminded that uh, Lewis Mumford 
the famous urban planner and philosopher who visited Hawaii in 1938. And he looked at the half-filled canal, the Alawai Canal, mm -hmm. and he said, why not extend it all the way to what is now Kamana Beach as a floodplain drainage area, he said in 1938. Any, any, just concretely, any thoughts of extending the canal all the way around to help drainage? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we've inherited a lot of legacy in terms of the built environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is big r risks around flooding in that Alawai uh, area. And, mm -hmm. you know, almost 10% of our GDP is, is emerges from that one yep. area yep. of Waikiki. Um, so th those are areas where we'll need to look at. How do we reduce the flood um, vulnerability for not only that area, but for all areas as we get more intense rains under, you know, as climate changes, we actually get longer periods of drought, mm -hmm. more intense rains when, when they do come. Um, but we're really interested in knowing what people out there think about um, our vulnerability and our resilience. And so, you know, as we build our resilience strategy with the help of the 100 um, Resilient Cities Network and Rockefeller Foundation over this next year, we're going out to ask people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to every single neighborhood board on the island. Uh, we're going out. I did a talk at Rotary yesterday um, and in Waikiki. And we're going out to as many populations as we can, just normal lay folk um, and different businesses, to say, what do you, what's your perception? What do you think we're vulnerable around? What do you think our strengths are? And where should we focus our attention on, on making ourselves mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. more resilient to these types of things? And so uh, we've got a survey that, we, that we're putting out to people, and we, we're hoping that you know, many hundreds of folks and thousands of folks actually weigh in with their opinion, because mm -hmm. it's really important to inform. It's a two-way street between you know, government and the population, and we want to make sure that we're focusing on the issues that people think are really important. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I live, I'm blessed to live in the back of Manoa on one of the slopes, and of course we get some really heavy rains there, and knock on wood, we have zero water accumulation problems. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the engineers who put that area together did a really good job of, of drainage. But we're the blessed ones. There's certainly, maybe even in the, oh, you know, it's just speaking of Manoa, uh, many years ago the canal got all clogged up with debris, and yeah. across uh, Woodlawn Road it got all clogged, and the water started coming over. I saw an SUV up in a tree right there, went right down to Hamilton Library in UH, and a friend or a cousin of mine works there, and she said there were people in the basement of Hamilton with, of course, no expectation of this. And the water came gushing in. They had to break windows and crawl out the windows. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. you know, part of, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, these bigger storm events means that some of the infrastructure we've developed actually is incapable of handling it or is undersized. Mm -hmm. um, and so really that local knowledge is what we're interested in yeah. is yeah. where are the spots that you see vulnerabilities now before mm -hmm. they become huge issues like they did in the in the Manoa flood mm -hmm. um, that had hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Um, and you know, and in addition, I mean I think it's really interesting to think about your role in that cycle, right? I mean you're recognizing the place where I live, the water sheds off, but where does it go? Yeah. And I think we need to be thinking as all citizens, I mean, we're really all um, in an island, we're all in this together. And so if we figure out where does, you know, when I do something, when I pave my driveway or when I, you know, take my gutter and put it into the storm drain, where does that wind up? And what's mm -hmm. my impact mm -hmm. on folks down more Mackay from me? Is there ways that I can mm -hmm. actually play a role in mitigating some of that? Um, because we also, we're, so, we're sort of all neighbors to each other on an island. You, you know, let me put in my own personal two cents. As you, I, I live in Woodlawn, and you wouldn't be surprised to know that I have planted the area as much as I can. And 100% of the runoff from my roof, which it sometimes is a minor flood in itself, all goes down to the water table. I've designed it like that. So that the water trickling down my driveway is just that, just a trickle in the heaviest rains, but my neighbor has done exactly the opposite. Pave, 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 pave everything. There's a gusher of water coming down and kind of overwhelming the, the storm drain. So if people were encouraged, monetarily incentivized, to get as much green space as they could, 
and put what are the, those paver blocks instead yep. of concrete so that the water absorbs in, in between them. Yeah, that's, that's just one potential area. You multiply that by 100,000 times and you, you've got a pretty good absorbency. Yeah, Factory no, I mean, I think, and that's exactly yeah. it. So mm -hmm. those are the kind of solutions that we hope people will pipe up with and we can see, you know, really where, where do people really believe our problems lie and what are the solutions mm -hmm. to them um, so that we can make sure that, that our office focuses and, and, you know, we can take back to um, Mayor Caldwell and everybody else who's supporting the mission of this office, mm -hmm. you know, what are the things that we can work on together that will answer the calls of the, of the public around yeah where we're vulnerable, and what are the solutions to that. And that's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, taking charge of, you know, your, the water that lands on your place and making sure that you're mm -hmm. doing, you know, what's essentially a rain garden, yeah. um, that's fantastic. Yeah, and the people know about their local spots, and so you're getting input from their local spots. I give one report, but somebody living down in the center of the valley is going to give an entirely different report. Right. And somebody living in Makiki is going to give it a different report. Well, and, and yeah. different policies, you know, work mm -hmm. in different areas, right? You get a lot of rain in Manoa, mm -hmm. so having a rain garden there makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Somebody in Eva, you know, it may not be worth it to have yeah. a sort of a, a monetary incentive or some sort of program because it may be just not be enough yeah, rain they, they to make it worth They get 20 uh, inches a year. Right. So, I mean, I think that's why in the, the challenge here for us is really to be... Um, unique and innovative in our approach to these things and really mm -hmm. tailor it to the situation. And that's why we want to hear um, people's different lenses and, and mm -hmm. views. So um, on our website um, yeah, at, why, why at the Why don't we office, bring up that uh, website right now and we, we can discuss it? Yeah, there. so um, we've got an office, uh, a website for the Office of Sustainability, um, mm -hmm. or Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency. It's uh, called resilientawahu.org. Oh, um, it's on the screen now. Fantastic. Um, so anyone in the public uh, mm -hmm. is welcome to go to the website, click on the box that says take our survey. It takes about 10 minutes. It's short. Um, and what we're hoping to do is get as many voices as possible uh, to inform our work and really set us in the right direction. It'll set the agenda for our resilience strategy and hopefully the mm -hmm. strategy for decades to come in the city about making ourselves as strong and uh, sort of resilient against these challenges that you and I have been talking yeah, about this. And, this and last again, hour. we we know about the place where we live. We're pretty gosh darn expert yeah. in that. So by getting that little localized genius and then multiplying it, hopefully by a hundred thousand times, and then having some kind of, kind of computer algorithm to <laughs> sort it all out. That's, no, that's exactly yeah. what we do have. In yeah. fact, and so the the Rockefeller folks have done this in you know a hundred cities mm -hmm. now. And so what we do is we feed all that input into a tool that they yeah. have, and it sort of shows you, here's what people are concerned about and their perceptions, how well we're doing, how, how not well we're mm -hmm. doing. Here's the solutions that they think mm -hmm. are most innovative for their localized area, and then maps all that out oh, to beautiful. say, what are the ones that are the lowest hanging fruit that mm -hmm. are going to have the most benefit for the most people, um, and you know where should we tackle first? So it's really a prioritization tool, yeah. um, but it also lets us be really accountable to the public and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, here's your chance to really put in Absolutely. your mono and wow. help us shape what you know. Real, we'll real live on. democracy. What a what a concept here. <laughs> and now I'm so glad we can end on a cheery note that should give us all great hope. We must leave, but thank you so much, Josh Stanbro. Resilient Chief Resilience Officer for City and County of Honolulu, Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig. See you next time. <laughs>